For the last about three months, uh, we have been talking about the church uh, from various passages in the New Testament. We have been talking about uh, the different roles and uh, function and purpose of the church. Uh, and we are going to wrap that up this morning. Uh, we will finish our, our discussion, our study on Sunday mornings about the church. But uh, I will say that there are some uh, needed conversations to come about practice. Uh, we have a uh, family meeting scheduled uh, for August uh, to talk about some, some practical considerations uh, that we would, uh, we would talk about uh, coming up uh, near the end of August. So be, be on the lookout for that. Uh, we, have, uh, we have more things uh, to, to think about. Uh, so we will be concluding again this morning this, uh, this series on the church, and we will be picking back up uh, with uh, what uh, will be uh, the normal, uh, I would say, would be a detailed study of a book of the Bible. Uh, we will be going into the Old Testament, uh, looking at an Old Testament book. Uh, so I hope that you will uh, come and be a part of this uh, next uh, series that we are going to be doing. Uh, this morning, I would invite you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. Uh, in the book of Romans, we, we have been here a few times in, in the last few weeks in this series on the church. Uh, talking about uh, making reference to the body and its membership, that we have all been given gifts and uh, that we are put in the context of a family, of a body, to live out this life as the church. Uh, and uh, we uh, have uh, looked at Romans chapter 12. Uh, it says, uh, therefore, uh, I, he, Paul encourages... Uh, to be transformed by the renewing of their minds, not to live according to the ways of the world. Uh, and he begins to lay out in the last chapters of the book of Romans what the life of a Christian should look like. And so his encouragement is for people, uh, brothers and sisters, to, to hear uh, not only the theological truth of, of Romans chapters 1 through 11, but the practical application that he spells out in chapters 12 through 16. And today we want to dive in to Romans 15 verses 1 through 7 with some encouragement for the people of God. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to read along with me, I would encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 15. Paul writes, he says, We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together with one voice, that, you, that together you may with one voice glorify God and Father uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. In this passage of Scripture, there's four words that have been on my mind as I have been looking at it. And I want us to uh, look at these encouragements for the people of God. Uh, the first encouragement that I see in this, this passage of Scripture uh, about what the people of God uh, should uh, be like? What, what should this, discourage, uh, this description, this encouragement uh, be like? And the first one is this, is that we should be people who help. Uh, in verse 1, uh, Paul says that we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Uh, and that in this, he is, he is saying that uh, um, that there is an expectation, there is an obligation that those in the church have uh, to, to be people who help. And there's three questions I would ask of this verse. And 
uh, that would help us in understanding what Paul was saying. The first question he, that we would ask is who uh, should be doing the helping? Who are the helpers? Uh, and he states that right here in the verse. He says, the strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. And uh, so as, uh, as we think about that, uh, we, we need to understand a little bit of the context of what's going on. Uh, if you have some time, I'd encourage you to go back and read Romans chapter 14. It really gives more of a detailed explanation of, uh, of who the strong are, who the weak are, what are the issues going on. Uh, but Paul is making a, a, an assumption or a conclusion in chapter 15 that, that those who are grown uh, and have strong faith should help those who are weak. Uh, particularly in consideration in chapter 14, uh, is a discussion about what role the law should play in the Christian life. Uh, what uh, Should a person eat food that had been sacrificed to idols? Uh, we're not going to take a lot of time to get into that this morning. Uh, but the point that is being made in chapter 15 is this, is that those who have strength should help those without strength. Uh, if we were to look in the, the Greek New Testament, this word for strong and the word for weak are actually the same word in Greek, the same root word. Uh, and there's a way that it is written that in one place it shows strength and in another place we, we translate it weakness, but it, it literally is without strength. Uh, that uh, those who have strength or who are strong should help those who do not have strength. And so uh, we translate this word uh, strength or weakness. Uh, uh, other uh, translations might have uh, failings, infirmities, weaknesses. Uh, these, are, these are the things that, that Paul says, that those who are strong should, should help with those things. Uh, the word help here, uh, uh, that we should bear. Uh, that we should bear uh, with the failings of the weak. Uh, the word bear literally means to carry. Uh, it is uh, used in the Gospels to talk about the carrying of the cross. It, the, we bear a cross, uh, right? Um, that uh, as we follow Jesus, uh, that is a description of, of what we do. Uh, it's also the same word that, you, that is used in Galatians chapter 6. Uh, and instead of in Galatians, instead of using the word strong and weak in Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, those of you who are spiritual should bear the burdens of those, bear one another's burdens is what he says. And that, that he gives a, a qualification, he gives a description. Uh, the strong, those who uh, are spiritually mature, should bear the burdens, should help bear the burdens of other people. And so we see this description in the Scripture that those people who are strong and those who are spiritual should be on the lookout um, for the people around them who have weaknesses and failings and faults and that we should bear uh, with those things. So who, who is that? Paul mentions the strong. He mentions the spiritual uh, what should the help look like? So uh, if, uh, if we're reading in this description that we should be people who help, how should that help come across? What, what should that be like? Uh, in this passage, uh, the word is used, uh, please. Uh, it says in verse 1 that we should not please ourselves, but that we should please our neighbor. Uh, so what, what does that mean? How, how does that help us to understand or how does that bring us to the point of understanding the idea of help? What does it mean to please someone? Uh, and uh, we, a literal short uh, explanation would be this, is that we accommodate ourselves uh, for the needs and the wishes of others. And so when Paul is saying that those uh, who are strong should seek to please not himself but his neighbor, he's saying you should reorient yourself around the things that your neighbor wants and your neighbor needs. Uh, and he's saying that we need to think more of the needs and wishes of others than we think of ourselves. Uh, he is saying that we uh, don't uh, just think about what we want, what we need, but what does my neighbor need? And this 
neighbor, could be uh, you know, the person sitting beside you in church this morning. It could be the person that lives beside you where your house is. It could be your coworker that you're around that uh, uh, when you go to work every day. It's the people who are in proximity to you. How do you think about what they want and what they need? Somebody has said that the word humility uh, does not necessarily mean thinking less of yourself uh, as much as it means thinking more of other people. That uh, to, to be prideful means to only think of yourself and only think of your needs, whereas being humble means that we think of the needs of others. And so here, here is this idea that we, we put our focus on uh, on others. It should look like us living our lives thinking about what people around us need. Uh, and then uh, it gives us a, an, a question that we next answer, why? Not only who should help and uh, what we should be doing, but why should we help? Uh, in this uh, passage of, of scripture, it says that there are people, um, or we know in our world, that there are people who are motivated by selfish reasons. Uh, that the reason they, they do things is that they're looking out for themselves. Even when they seem to be doing something for you, they do it in expectation of something in return, uh, that they have selfish motives. Uh, and when Paul is writing this passage of Scripture about what the people of God should be like, uh, it is not from a motive of self, uh, selfishness, but a, a motive to serve, a desire to serve other people. Verse 2 and 3 says, Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Uh, here we, we see the why question. Why should we help other people? Why should we uh, be others-oriented? Why should we be focusing on others Needs and, and there are two things that this passage of Scripture says. Uh, the first thing it says is that we do this for their edification, uh, that when we uh, look out for the needs or we please our neighbor, we, we're oriented, we're accommodating to their needs and desires. It says that we do this for his good to build him up. Uh, the word we use is edification. We do it to, to build up, to edify our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, there, there is a lot of ways that we can get into and, and talk about needs and wants and how do we understand that uh, in, in the church. There's a lot of things uh, maybe that our neighbor wants or need, feels like he needs that he not, doesn't necessarily want or, or need. Uh, and the Bible gives some clarification that we, we do things that are for his good, uh, that we, we do need to have some thought about what his good uh, is, and that, that good is further defined, that what is going to build him up in the Lord. Uh, so we help uh, to build them up, to, to help them grow in their faith. And then the second thing that is mentioned here, that we help people is not only for their good, for their edification, but in order that we follow the example of Christ. Uh, it says here that, that Christ did not please himself, uh, but that, that he came to serve other people. We read a great description of this. We read uh, in a, a parallel passage in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8, uh, about the mindset of Christ. The, Paul uh, writes to the Philippians, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So Paul is saying to the Philippians the same things he is saying to the Romans. Uh, that as you think about your life, uh, where he says, uh, don't please yourself in Romans, he says to the Philippians, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, which is pride. Uh, but he says, in humility, count others more significant than yourself. What does that mean, to, to count others more significant than their self? Uh, so it would be a, a means of putting a priority on the things that others need more than the things that we need. That as Christians, that if we're, we're developing a mind of Christ, 
uh, that that's what this would look like. We, we develop a, a mindset that thinks of others before ourselves, that we place more um, uh, priority on the needs of others. That's what it would mean to be uh, to consider, uh, to count others more significant than ourselves. Uh, and let's continue with Philippians chapter 2. Uh, he says, have this mind among yourselves. Uh, let this be the way that you think, he says, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what is Paul saying in Romans 15? What is he saying in Philippians chapter 2? Is that we need to follow the example of Jesus who placed our needs above his own. Philippians says that have this mind in you which was in Christ Jesus. That he, though he sat with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit as God in heaven, he stepped down in, onto this earth to take on flesh, to live a life under the temptation of sin without sinning, to give his life as a perfect ransom for us so that we can have eternal life. He, he had the, our needs in mind. He, he had this uh, humility that he thought of others and God has, the rest of the chapter in Philippians says that God has exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. And so we want to be helpers of other people because uh, uh, we want to build them up. We want to edify them, but we want to follow the example of Christ. Uh, we also should be people who have hope uh, that the next thing I see in this passage of Scripture when it describes what the people of God should be like, it says that we should be people who have hope. Verse 4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Uh, so here Paul is, is presenting this idea that... that uh, uh, we need to be people who have hope. And how, where does hope come from? How do we get hope? Uh, and there's a little bit of, uh, of that in this passage of Scripture. Paul says, whatever has been written. Now, what, what does that mean? Uh, Paul uh, was writing uh, to the Romans. He was in the process uh, of writing the part of the New Testament right. So he's talking about what has already been written. So when he says that, he's really referring to the Old Testament scriptures, uh, what, we would, what we think of as the Old Testament. So when Paul says, what has been written has been written for our instruction that through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. He's pointing us back to the Old Testament. And there's two things that he says that we will learn when we read the Old Testament scriptures uh, and he mentions them here. He says the idea of endurance. The, the scripture, the Old Testament scripture, is going to teach us about endurance. Uh, the Old Testament is filled with examples of people who were in difficult circumstances. And in the middle of their difficult circumstances, they were hoping in the Lord. They were trusting in the Lord. Uh, they endured all kinds of hardships uh, as you think about different examples from the Old Testament, you can think, uh, you can see how these things were played out. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 gives us the cliff notes uh, version of some of these examples from the Old Testament, talking about the difficulties that these Old Testament uh, saints faced, but that through their faith in God, through their trust in God, through their hope in God, they endured difficult circumstances. And by studying the Old Testament scriptures, we get an idea of the endurance that people had. Does God always fix our problems? Does God always take away our pains right away? He doesn't. A lot of times what we need to do is endure. We just need to hold on to our faith. We need to hold on to our hope. 
not a promise that we are going to be pain-free and everything's going to be fine and dandy, but we are holding on to this idea. We are enduring in the middle of hard times that God is faithful and He is good. And we learn this from reading the Old Testament. How many of the Old Testament writers uh, wrote something along these lines? How long, O oh Lord, will we have to endure this situation? And it shows uh, that in their hard circumstances, in their difficult uh, lives that they were living, they were crying out to the Lord and they wondered, how long is this going to go on? And we learn an example. We see uh, endurance being played out based on faith. And when we study the Old Testament scriptures, we are taught about endurance. Uh, and that uh, he says there's another thing, that uh, it's through the encouragement of the Scriptures that we might have hope. Uh, in reading the Old Testament Scriptures, in reading not only these, uh, these narratives of these Old Testament saints who lived hard lives and cried out to the Lord, uh, we learn a lot about who God is, that in uh, these Old Testament examples, we, we learn about the faithfulness and the goodness of God. And in repeated uh, time and time again in the Old Testament is the encouragement to God's people to trust in His goodness, trust in His power, trust in His wisdom, trust Him in that He hears and that He sees and that He knows what you're going through. And that what we see of God in the Old Testament is true also in the New Testament and is true in our times today. And that if we are going to be filled with hope, we need to find these things in the Scripture, the endurance that is described and the encouragement to cry out to, the, to, the God, uh, to, to God and a reminder of who God is. Um, in Romans 15, Paul writes more about this. In verse 8, he says, uh, I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's faith, truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. Uh, when he writes this in Romans, again, he's pointing back to the Old Testament. He's looking at Christ, and what does he say? What does verse 8 say? It says, Christ, uh, He became a servant to the circumcised, the, the Jews, the Jewish uh, leaders, the Jewish rulers, and what he, what he became an example of, what he was showing was God's truthfulness. That all the, He says that the promises to the patriarchs all through the Old Testament when God made prophecies, when he made promises uh, to the patriarchs, Jesus was showing that God was true, God was right, God was faithful in all of these things through the Old Testament. And he is encouraging the Roman believers, and I would encourage you today to look back at who God has been through history, what He has done, how He has acted, the ways that He has responded to His people. Even if it wasn't in the time that they wanted, there was deliverance, there was help, there was hope for them in the middle of the circumstances that they faced. And what does Paul do here in Romans 15? He is reminding us of who God is. He is saying that God is a God of truthfulness. God is a God of faithfulness to honor His promises. He says that God is a God of mercy, that in these promises in the Old Testament, that even the Gentiles were included in the blessings of God. He says that the, the Gentiles may praise God for His mercy. He is reminding His people to think about who God is. If we were to keep on reading uh, in Romans 15, in verse 13, and listen to what Paul says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. So he is saying to them uh, that it is a reminder of who God is. He actually says uh, that the, the God of hope uh, would fill you with joy and peace in believing. That uh, he, he repeats this important idea uh, of having hope, that this God of hope would fill with joy and peace. And he says that in the power of the Holy Spirit that you would abound in hope. Uh, that word abound is, is one that it means that we would have plenty. We would have enough. We would have more than enough hope 
if we are, are, uh, are, are catching what he is saying. And let me, let me say it to you this way, and it's something that I, I've, I've said in different ways a, a lot of different times. The saints should study the scriptures together in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that when the saints and the scripture and the spirit is involved, there are going to be good results. And one of the particular results that is mentioned here in this passage is that when the saints study the scripture under the power of the Holy Spirit, that they will abound in hope. This is uh, the way that the people of God should carry out their Christianity, that the, sta- the saints study the scripture under the guidance of the Holy Spirit And a result is that we are going to have hope. We should also be people who live in harmony. We we live in harmony. We we live in in help. We're people who help. We we are people who have hope. Uh, But we should be people who live in harmony. Uh, Here he says uh, in verse 5, May the God of endurance... uh, Uh, and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another. Uh, So he mentions this idea that what is it like for the people of God to exist together, to to live together, to to be a a group together? And he uses this word harmony. Uh, And uh, again, back to kind of what is going on when Paul is writing the book of Romans. Uh, In the time of the New Testament, when the New Testament was being written, there was a major issue in the world uh, about the people of God that that we read as the the church. Uh, The church in in Rome, the church in Corinth, the church in Philippi, all of these different churches that that Paul wrote to. Uh, He's addressing, uh, he addresses an issue that is happening in the world. Uh, And one of the things that was going on that made it extremely difficult for the people of God to get along, to live in harmony, was because of the different backgrounds that they came from. Uh, There were a a lot of people who came to faith in Jesus Christ uh, who had come from a Jewish background. Uh, They had learned the Old Testament law. They had learned the Old Testament scriptures. And they knew that in order, at least under the Old Testament, their understanding was that in order to please God, you have to live by all of these rules. You have to live by all of this law. And now here we come into the New Testament and we find that the gospel is going out to people who did not grow up Uh, with an idea of what God had said in the Old Testament law, but people who lived such pagan lives that they didn't have any idea about God at all. Uh, Acts chapter 17 is a, is a great place to go and read. Paul goes uh, to Athens and he meets people there and, and they're so concerned about worshiping God in a right way that the whole city uh, is filled with, with idols to gods, even to the point that there's an idol that says to the unknown God. And Paul sees that as his entrance, a place for him to say, let me tell you about this unknown God that you're trying to worship. Uh, that there are people who do not know God, do not have any idea of what he is like, what his character is like. And, and now, all of a sudden, in the church, uh, we have people who have been raised up on this, uh, this uh, uh, rigorous set of rules and laws. And these people who have lived their lives pretty much any way that they wanted to, and now coming together in the church as the people of God, uh, they find that they are in a lot of conflict. Can you, do you understand how this happens? How, how you come from, from one perspective and somebody else comes from another perspective? And it's hard to get on the same page. Uh, even in marriage, right? We, we marry somebody and we think we're pretty close together. and We have the same mind, but we find out on a daily basis sometimes, right? We're not coming from the same place. And, and we, need, we need some help to get back on the same page. Uh, and Paul is saying that to the, the Christians in Rome. He says this uh, to other people in other books, that, that there is a difficulty in getting along with other people. Uh, that because people come from different backgrounds and have different desires and have different needs, it's hard to get along with people. But Paul stresses this importance that that we as people of God should live in harmony. 
uh, that we should, should live in harmony, uh, that, that we should strive to get along. And that means that there are a lot of things from our lives, a lot of needs that we feel like we have, a lot of desires that we feel like we want, uh, that we need to set aside in order to get along with God's people. Uh, James chapter 4 actually talks about the nature of conflict. It says, where do wars and fights come from? Why do you live in conflict with your neighbor? Uh, And he says, James says, that it's because the desires that you want are not being met. The things that you want and you feel like you need are not being met. And so that leads to conflict. That leads to fights and wars. And so Paul is saying we need to put those things aside and live in harmony. Uh, So ESV, we read here, uh, Paul says, uh, I want you to uh, to live in harmony, that uh, that you should, should live in this way. Uh, in harmony. Now, I don't know how many of you here this morning have a different translation of the Bible, uh, but uh, other translations do not read the same way. ESV says that we should live in such harmony. Uh, Those of you who have a King James Version or a NIV or New American Standard will not find the word harmony, but what you will find is that these other three translations encourage having the same mind. Do you see it? Those of you who have another translation, do you see that there in your your Bible? That Paul says, what is the way uh, that we should live? We should strive, try to be of the same mind. We should think in the same ways, that we should have the same desires, and that we should have a same understanding of what our needs are. And so we, we, we read this, we, we hear the scripture, it says that being of the same mind, whereas in Philippians says that having the same mind of Christ is going to lead us to live in humility, uh, we find here it says having the same mind as Christ is going to us, lead us to live in harmony, that we are going to be getting along with people in the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. That, uh, that when petty squabbles come up and when we get into arguments over things that don't really matter, we need to set those things aside and that we need to work on our relationship being right with each other. The history of churches is filled with examples of churches not living in harmony. Do you have a personal example from your life of churches who have not lived in harmony? Uh, do you know of churches that have split their membership over the color of the carpet? Do you know churches that have split their membership about where, which side of the stage the piano is on? Do you, have you ever been to a church that they get into an argument about what kind of vacuum cleaner to buy for the church? These are things that should not divide us. But what do we find? That we get so caught up in these minor, minuscule, empty things and it causes division in our churches. And Paul says that we need to live in harmony. That those things should not distract us. Those things should not divide us. Uh, But that we should strive to have the mind of Christ uh, that we are not so wrapped up in what I want and I need, but that I, in humility, recognize that there are other perspectives and other people who might want things as well. And that we will live not only in humility, but live in harmony with one another. Uh, And this message is repeated over and over and over again in the New Testament uh, because we all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different experiences uh, and that we have an idea in mind of the way that things should go. And that often leads to fights, that leads to conflict. And so Paul here, he says, you should live in such harmony. He uses the words here, he says, harmony with one another. I know I've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks uh, repeating, rehearsing, uh, reviewing this idea that the Scripture uh, over and over and over again presents these ideas that we should live with a one another mentality. And there's a, a lot of different ways that the Scripture says this, depending on who you talk to. 
could be anywhere to from 30 to 50 or 60 different one another commands uh, that are found in the scripture. Over and over and over again, these things are repeated. And every time, in every situation, Paul and other writers are telling us, uh, let this be the mind that you should, uh, should do this, that you should love, that you should bear burdens, and that you should encourage, and that you should pray, and that you should should do all these things, and that we should be in a context where this is happening uh, with one another. It should be mutually beneficial. It should be reciprocal uh, that this is happening. Paul saying the way to live in harmony is this, uh, that you be in harmony with one another, that you have the same mind and ideas about loving and serving and bearing and encouraging uh, that others do. Have this mind in you that, that leads you to live a life of harmony with other people. But he says not only do we need to live in such harmony with one another, he says uh, that you also be in accord with Christ Jesus. Uh, he says as we're thinking about what it means to, people, to be the people of God, not only do we need to look uh, horizontally at the people that are around us and try and live in a way that's harmonious and not based on my own uh, selfish uh, desires and needs, but, uh, but thinking of others, but he says that, that we live in accord with Christ. Uh, and this is another way of saying that we as the people of God not only need to get along with each other, but that we need to agree with Christ. We need to be in accord of the same mind again with Christ. And he says for this reason that we should be in harmony, that we should be different people, but that we should have one voice. Um, that, that uh, we would, uh, uh, with one accord in Christ Jesus, that together with one voice, glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That in the people of God, we do not come together and our history is not completely erased. Our differences don't go away. We still have our own life experiences and the things that have happened to us and who we feel like we are. And those differences are not erased, but Paul says that in the church we can come together and be unified and that we, with one voice, can raise uh, up praise to the Lord. And so it is not so much about our differences that we uh, think about, but uh, what do we have in common? We have a common Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and with one voice we should join together in praising Him. More and more, this world that we live in is divided. We are divided by uh, race. We're divided by economic status. We're divided by political belief. We're divided by so many different things. But what we find is in the church is this ideal, even though the church experiences these things, the ideal, the, 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 the thing that we should shoot for, the thing that we should aim for is, is unity, is a harmony that goes above all racial differences, a harmony that goes above all economic differences, uh, a love and a harmony that's even bigger than our political beliefs. We should cry out and be united in praise to the Lord. The last thing I would share with you this morning is this, is that we should be people that honor God. Uh, when Paul writes, he says uh, that, that together with, with one voice, we glorify God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it's, it, that we should honor God. Uh, to glorify God means to worship God, to show Him the honor that He is due. And a couple of ways that the Scripture says that uh, is, is found here in this passage. He says uh, that, that we are be unified, we live in harmony uh, he says in verse 7, Therefore, welcome one another. Here is a very practical step that in a, in a place where you come in and you see people that are different than you, you see people that may come from a different background, you see people that come from a different uh, lifestyle, you come, see people that come from uh, different places in this world, uh, that what does he say? Welcome them. Welcome them, that, that we, we welcome one another, that we may, you, you may be committed to the Razorbacks, but that when an LSU fan walks in here, you should welcome them. 
I say that as a joke. I saw, I saw that shaking head. Uh, I know. I, that's a light example, right? But shouldn't we get more serious with it? If we're a Republican and we see a Democrat walk in, should we welcome them? If we belong to a privileged class of people and we see somebody from maybe the wrong side of the tracks come in, should we, should we welcome them? Yes. The scripture says, welcome one another. So the encouragement was for these Jews, these Gentiles that came from very different backgrounds, from very different perspectives, uh, to, to, to take a step, to build a bridge rather than, uh, than walking away. Welcome them. Welcome one another. And then he says, uh, not only should you welcome them, and it gives a reason for welcoming, it says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. What is the motive? What is the motive for us building bridges to other people, to seeking harmony, to, to welcoming them in? And Paul says the reason that we do that is because we have been welcomed by Christ. I hope that truth will grip your heart. What was it like for Christ to welcome you? In your sin? In your own selfish desires? In your life, committed to honoring yourself above all other things? Christ welcomed you into his presence. I guarantee you, there are more differences between you and Christ than there are you and any other human group. And that Christ has welcomed us. He has invited us into his presence. And Paul says that we need to have that attitude towards each other. That we need to welcome one another because Christ has welcomed us. It really is a, a testimony to the power of the gospel that the gospel, the good news, that even though we were born dead in trespasses and sins, uh, all of our life being offensive to a holy God, uh, that God in his mercy, God in his grace has given us a propitiation, a, a theological word that the Bible uses to describe a sacrifice that appeases the wrath of God. And that because of that propitiation, that sacrifice that appeases the wrath of God, now he gives eternal life, he gives new life, he gives uh, uh, Christian life uh, to us. He, he has welcomed us into his presence. And, and the result of that should be this, that we welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us for the glory of God. Uh, that when we come together, what is our purpose? What is our reason? What, why do you live the way you do? And the ultimate thing that we learn in the scripture is this. There can only be one ultimate goal in your life. And that ultimate goal should be the glory of God. You should try to honor God and glorify God in every single thing that you do. And that is, that is why we, we should live in this way. Paul writes these things and others in, in, in the book of Romans about what it should be like for us to be the people of God. Here are just four ideas uh, from these short verses that, that we should try uh, to make a part of our life, that we be people who help, uh, that we be people who have hope, uh, that we be people who live in harmony, and that we be people who honor God. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we finish out our, our time of study this morning. God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful for these truths that we find in your word. God, I know that in studying your word with your people under the power of the Holy Spirit, God, you are going to work in our lives. And Lord, I ask that is, that is what you do this morning. Lord, that as we, your people, have gathered, Lord, we have opened up the scripture and Lord, we are asking that the Holy Spirit would take these words and, and apply them to our heart and our mind. And Lord, that we, uh, in trying to, to live in these ways, would honor you and glorify you with our lives. Lord, I pray for this time of reflection. Lord, I pray for this time of response. Lord, as we have heard your word, God, that we would uh, take it and be willing to, to live our lives differently this week because of what you have showed us. 
God, I pray that you would bring to mind ways that our lives need to change, ways that we need to repent in order to live a life that is right and holy, and Lord, uh, and Lord that, that you would have us to live. God, I pray, uh, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of your mercy and your grace. Lord, not to run away from you in our sin, but to run to you because you are a good and loving God, full of grace and mercy for us. And Lord, you have showed that grace and mercy through your son's death on the cross. Lord, so that you, you tell us that any who believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God, I pray for our church, God, that we would be people who live in harmony. Lord, that we would work hard to get along with one another, not being uh, divided over petty things, but Lord, putting aside, Lord, our, our wants, our desires in, in the interest of, of helping others. Uh, and God, that we, again, would honor you and glorify you as a church. We pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.